Okay, tonight we are uh, very happy to have a very important person here, uh, Sheikh Mohammed El Shinavi. Uh, she, he is a dedicated student of knowledge who grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed had towards the studies of Quran, Hadith, Fiqh, and Aqidah at an er early age and studied in Medina University for a short period. Sheikh Mohammed is a research fellow at the Akin Institute for Isla Islamic Research and the religious director at IECPA in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Third, further, he has translated major works for the International Islamic Pub Publishing House, the Assembly of Muslim Jurists, and Mishka University. Thanks, uh, thank you very much for being here tonight, and it's your turn now. My phone is off, just a timer. <laughs> Even though I am a millennial, by the way, I just made the cut, but I'm not that kind of millennial. <laughs> so it is now 7.24. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a discount. 45 minutes, I'll keep them to 36 minutes. I'll give myself a hard cut off at 8 o'clock, God willing. So if there's any questions, uh, we can have a, maybe a less formal conversation. So first, I, I begin as is... Uh, Recommended for us Muslims by praising God, the one true God, almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. All praise and glory belongs to him. Uh, certainly, our Lord is deserving of the best thanks and the most beautiful of praises. Those that we say and far above and beyond anything we can ever say about him. And may his finest peace and blessings be upon his prophets and his messengers whom he sent uh, as guides to humanity. Uh, and allow us lives upon their path and allow us to conclude our lives in their example, having actualized a bit of what they've actualized with human excellence. Allahumma ameen. So I was contacted uh, a few weeks back by, by Walter, who I hear is, is not feeling well, and I pray he'll, he can recover and return to full strength and full health soon. And he asked me to share uh, the Islamic perspective or some reflections from the Islamic perspective on the great patriarch, the, the prophet of God, Abraham, Peace and blessings be upon him, the Prophet Abraham. Uh, he felt like that was a good angle to tie in with much of what would be discussed on your Wednesday nights that I'm less informed about than you guys. So I hope it's somewhat related, and I hope there's a connection, uh, and that there's some sort of benefit in it at, at the end. And so before I, and I will not give you the, the chronological entire story of Abraham, peace be upon him. There's a great deal of overlap between all of the... Uh, Judeo-Christian and Islamic traditions, there's lots of overlap there. But more about how and why the style with which God speaks. We believe the Quran is the final testament, the word of God, the final revelation sent to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 1400 years ago. How he speaks about Abraham and how that ties into the bigger picture, the bigger picture of Islam. Uh, the Islamic proposition, if you will, on life the existential question, like the question of our existence and what it really means and what's, what we're supposed to make out of it and all these things. And maybe it's a good place to start there. So the Quran leaves it uh, in no unclear terms what the purpose of the human being's life is. So for instance, God the Most High says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create the humans and the jinn, another creation like the human beings. Uh, I did not create the humans or the jinn except to devote their lives to me alone. Except to devote their lives to me alone. ما أريد منهم من رزق وما أريد أن يطعمون. I do not need of them any provisions. I don't need of from human beings to provide for me. That's not why I'm asking for devotion. It's not for a need that I have, meaning it's a need for, that they have. But I'll continue the translation just so I don't get ahead of myself. I do not need of them to provide for me, nor do I need from them to feed me. Inna Allah huwa al-razzaq wa quwwat al-mateen. Rather, it is God who is the provider, the bearer of great strength, the Almighty. In other words, I created the human beings and their most inherent need is their need to devote their lives to me, to recognize me, to behold me, to live in awe of me and in commitment of me. Other places in the Quran, Allah the Most High, He says, Allah is the name of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Christians that are Arabs use the word God. On the first page of the Bible in Arabic, it says Allah 16, 17 times, right? Because Allah is the proper name of God, kind of like Elohim. It's just, it's God with the big G. 
<laughs> if you will. And so he says, أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ Certainly, no doubt, it is only in the remembrance of God, in living a life that is mindful of God, do the hearts find reassurance. Meaning, the hearts do not find reassurance, inner peace, tranquility, fulfillment in anything like they do that can stand in the place of living a life that is mindful of God. So we believe that we were created to devote our lives to Him in loving, willing, committed, dedicated, surrender to Him. Uh, and that is the meaning of Islam, by the way. Islam means surrender, willing, loving, peaceful surrender, meaning to God, to the will of God. Interesting, I know one uh, uh, former priest from, uh, from, from Texas uh, who says that one of the reasons why he found himself inclined to Islam at some point in his life, he said, because the Lord's Prayer used to mean very much to me. It was ingrained in my psyche. It was ingrained in my personality from childhood. And we would say in the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, right? Here on earth as it is in heaven. He says, and then when I discovered Islam, I felt that Islam was the roadmap on how to actually live up to this. This was his perspective. He's saying that we believe that God's will is always done in heaven, right? No, nothing in the universe, in God's universal order can object. Everything runs in such beautiful orbit, such beautiful, synchronized, impeccable design. And then the only thing left is us here on earth, where God gave us a degree of free will, a degree of, and it's our job now, to align ourselves with his will, meaning the will that he taught to us, his pleasure, what he legislated for us. And he found that Islam is just that. Islam, by definition, surrender to will of God. That's why you're here. That's what gives you fulfillment. That's what makes your life meaningful. Anything else uh, would not offer that in that same way, in that same level. Uh, it is very important to mention also, or not, I guess, underplay that the word worshiping God, because many times if you read in the Quran, I did not create the humans except to worship me. The word ibadah in Arabic does not mean worship in the same sense that first comes to mind with the English connotation of the word worship, right? So there are 60 words for love in the Arabic language, as the linguist will, will explain. 60 degrees of love, right? There's like, you know, like fondness, captivation, bewilderment. The highest, the very highest of the forms of love in Arabic is called ibad, right? To be enthralled in the love of God, to feel powerless to God, just in almost involuntarily surrendering to God out of love for Him, out of love for Him. Ibadah, ibadah. Uh, and so it's loosely translated as worship, but it's not meant in the technical, ritual, mechanical worship that usually comes to mind. It's a much deeper meaning than that. So all of our rituals are actually, in reality, expressions of our love for God, right? And our captivation and our awe uh, and our adoration of Him. That's what, it, that's what you were created for, to live your life adoring God. That manifests in, in devoting to Him ritually, spiritually, absolutely. And it also manifests in serving humanity and loving for them what you would love for yourself and being more merciful and compassionate with them than you would be with your own self, because God is more compassionate with us. And if we love God, then we're going to love what He loves, right? And so here's the hard part. <laughs> or not the hard part, but sometimes it gets a little bit contentious. And if the words that I choose are misplaced, please forgive me and give me the benefit of the doubt and shout me down once the lecture is over, okay? Okay, good. <clears throat> trying to be as selective as possible, just to be also particular to people's cultural sensitivities and religious sensitivities. We believe in Islam that, we are taught in Islam through the Quran, that loving God, loving God, number one, can never be devoid of action, right? I do understand some people's theology assert that salvation is ascertained by the grace of God, not by actions. That's why I'm trying not to seem too offensive here. Please don't be offended. And you can say what you want, you won't offend me, I promise. <laughs> but we do believe, by the way, that a person will never be saved without God's grace. 
it requires God's grace above all, that he opened the door for you, right, to grant you eligibility, to invite you in. But what does it mean to be invited in? It means to be invited to live in devotion, to act devotion to God, to act devoutly to God. Because that is the truest marker of love. The truest marker of love is sacrifice. When you love your child and they're sick, it's not a burden on you to leave the house at 3 a.m. to get them some fever reducer, right? Love lightens burdens. In the beginning of marriage, in the honeymoon phase, when the love <laughs> is at its highest and the passions are flaring, you give up your wants for the wants of your likes, your pleasures for the pleasures of the one that you love, right? Okay. So that's the picture, the purpose of life in Islam, devote our lives to God lovingly, and that's going to automatically, if it's genuine, translate into sacrifice. Enter the story of Abraham now. That took nine minutes. Okay, so the majority is going to be the story of Abraham. I didn't mess up. You will not find in the Quran, which we believe is the final word of God, you will not find in the Quran any example sent or like presented for humanity that is as celebrated after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, like the Prophet Abraham. Peace and blessings be upon him. Uh, and, and that is why the scholars of Islam, there's a small uh, discussion among the scholars of Islam regarding who is the most celebrated prophet in the timeline of prophets after the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Uh, was it Moses or was it Abraham? And so those who say Moses, they'll say because Moses was mentioned in the Qur'an by name more than any other prophet, over 130 times. And those that will say Abraham, they'll say, but the, that's a quantitative count. Okay, but qualitatively, nobody was as celebrated as Abraham, peace be upon him. So I want to share a bit of that and how it ties into the story of what it means to be guided to your purpose in life, be in awe of God, live in devotion to him. God, for example, says about Abraham, peace be upon him, وَإِذِ ابْتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنَّ قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامًا And mention to them, meaning O Muhammad, who's reciting the Qur'an, and mention to them, mention to the world, about Abraham, whom God tested, whom God tested with so many commands, فَأَتَمَّهُنْ And he passed them all with flying colors. He fulfilled them all without exception. So God said to him, I am making you a, an imam, a leader, a leading example for all of humanity. So every time God requested of Abraham to sacrifice, Abraham was there ready to sacrifice, right? That's why another, just such a powerful verse in the Quran, Allah the Most High says, I'll spare you the details of the context of that other verse, but in it he'll say, and Abraham who fulfilled. But then the, the nuance here is what? It's an open-ended sentence. It doesn't say what he fulfilled, because he fulfilled everything. He fulfilled the purpose of life. And if the purpose of life is to love God with all your heart and all your mind, and all your, we believe that in Islam as well, yes? And all your soul and all your strength, he did that above, every, above everyone else. And how do we know he did that above everyone else? Because all the sacrifices he was demanded to make, he made them. Uh, and so a few examples. The example of the slaughter of his son, irrespective of the discrepancy between the faith traditions, was it, was it Ishmael or was it Isaac? Just putting that aside. We are told in many instances in the Quran that Abraham, peace be upon him, asks God for a son for decades on end, and God tests him with patience, right? He tested him by not giving him. And then when he, when he reaches old age, some chroniclers say, though this is not in our text, but there's nothing to deny it either, he's reaching 80 years of age, just when you think you're, it's not destined for you to have a child, and that's when it becomes even dearer to you than ever, you, you receive a child. He receives his son, which we believe was Ishmael. Uh, other faith traditions believe it was Isaac. Uh, and so he has this child, and then as soon as he has this child, God tells him, go leave this child and his mother in the wilderness and walk away. Right? It's like, 
the only thing more difficult than yearning for a child for that long is losing the child after you actually get them, after you've tasted fatherhood with that child, at an age when you don't expect you'll have another one anymore because you didn't think you would have this one either. And so it is illustrated for us this portrait of how he went and he placed the child in the desert and walked away, gave them some rations of food and walked away. So his wife would call out to him, Hagar would call out to him and say, oh, Abraham, who are you leaving us to? Who are, like, this is not from his behavior. This is not noble behavior. This is the noblest man. Who are you leaving us to? And he could not respond to her. Perhaps he was not allowed to respond. Allah knows best. But he did not respond to her. Until in the end, she said, did God command you to do this? He turned around and he said, yes. And so she said to him, and then he will not ruin us. God will not ruin us. And she paced, as you know in the story, or you may know from the story, she paced back and forth and the rations ran out looking for any way to stop her child, to prevent her child from dying of starvation or of, or of thirst. And ultimately God sent the archangel Gabriel, peace and blessings be upon him, to strike with his heel beneath her feet and cause for the blessed well of Zamzam, the well of Zamzam to erupt, the well of Zamzam that exists until today, that exists until today in the city of Mecca. Uh, and so this was a profoundly difficult test, right? And the only way someone can pass a test of that nature, something that rigorous, the love of your child, is that your love for God was greater than your love for your child, right? And then Ishmael, peace and blessings be upon him, grows, and Abraham returns to live with them ultimately, or returns to visit them ultimately. And then he turns to his son one day, when his son is o just old enough to walk with him. The verse says, When his son reaches a point where he can start walking with him, he says to his son, Oh my son, I see in my dreams that I'm slaughtering you. And his son understands, as his, prophet, as his father must have taught him, that the, the dreams of the prophets are not like our dreams. The dreams of the prophets are revelation. Uh, and so he says to him, Oh my father, do as you are commanded. Do as you are commanded. Of course, he was not consulting his son. We don't believe that he was consulting his son, what should I do? Uh, he was ensuring that his son was surrendering to God's will the same way the father was, so that his son is not objecting to God, if you will, appalled at God uh, for this. And so he said, do as you are commanded, my father, God willing, God willing, you will find me of the patience. The verses continue to say, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَ So when both of them surrender, they pass the test. وَتَلَّهُ <laughs> لِلْجَبِينَ And he laid him down. We called out to him, O Abraham, you have fulfilled the command. Because the command here was what? The test was the love of God greater or was the love of your son greater. Right? That was the benefit of the test. And once the point was proven, once the test was passed, there's no wisdom there and you're slaughtering your son. Right? And so that was abrogated. That rule was removed. Uh, and then of the, the most beautiful words of, of, virtue, of, uh, of praise you find for Abraham in the Quran, citing a, fourth pa a third passage now, God the Most High says, وَاتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا And God, Allah, has chosen to take Abraham as a khalil. As, as his close friend. Meaning God loved Abraham and took Abraham as an intimate friend. The scholars of Islam, they reading this cumulatively with other verses from the Quran and statements from our Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, they call our attention to something very important. They say that what is more important, that you love God or that God loves you? They say that it's God, God that loves you. That's what's most important. Because you loving, many, for many reasons, of them is that you loving someone or something could be for your own good, right? It makes you, it's, it's a blessing to be able to love and be loved, be, right? To love someone, to love something, that serves you. It's a pleasant feeling, right? But when you, you're serving God and God loves you, this is the most selfless act, right? That means you are serving God more than you're serving yourself. 
There's no share for yourself in here. There's no share for the ego in this. It's not self-serving whatsoever. And so when a person sacrifices themselves, if you will, their ego, to serve God, they earn the love of God. And when they earn the love of God, which is most important, then they are, it's a beautiful cycle. It's a virtuous cycle. And then God guides you to love them further. And so it becomes easier and easier to devote your lives to Him. And you continue to get closer and closer and closer and closer to God until we will never reach the station of Abraham. <laughs> but until you climb to those beautiful heights of being one with God. Uh, and uh, God even says about Ibrahim alayhi uh, salam that he was such uh, a paramount example of what it meant to live for God. He said, Inna Ibrahim kana ummah. This is the fourth passage in the Quran. Abraham was a nation all by himself. God strengthened him to the point. His convictions ascended. His spiritual, his relationship with God ascended to the point where when the entire world rejected him and the entire world uh, fought him, combated him, he accepted being the only believer on the face of the earth. He was the nation of believers on his own at one point in time, all by himself. Where does the person find that determination? Where does the person find that strength? Where does the person find that resoluteness? You see, God being with someone, we believe, is not necessarily something that is measured on the outside, right? Like, people think that good things happen to good people and like bad things happen to bad people. And that concept could get you very upset at God, by the way, in our times. That's not how the world functions, right? And that's an existential issue. It's the way you, we understand our existence. No. We believe this whole life was a test, but your ability to have the moral fortitude, the psychological resilience to get through the tests, that's only possible for people that are supplied, reinforced, invigorated by God. And so someone loses their money and their whole life is over, right? Just they're, they're ready to, to pull the plug because they lost their life savings. Other people lose absolutely everything. They lose their family and their wealth and their reputation, everything. And somehow, they're just so at peace with themselves. They're so contained. They're so collected. They have their tranquility. It's, it cannot be compromised. It's like a prick of a thorn to them. What's the difference? This is a state of the heart, right? Or else, how do you explain Islam teaches? Forgive me if I'm speaking in what may come off as a little bit of a dogmatic term, is how do you explain that prophets and messengers were killed? If God was with them, how did they get killed? Right? The fact that they were able to make a sacrifice like that without wavering in their conviction of God, without feeling betrayed by God, this is a gift from God. This is a, this is a sign that God loved them. Right? And so Abraham was a nation on his own uh, whom God loved dearly. And so this is how he was able to love God so much. How do you get to the point? How do you get to the point? As we said, it's a, of this virtuous cycle. How do you get to the point where God loves you? Because God does love everyone, enough to invite them. But then you have to respond to the invitation, right? To earn the love, that special kind of love, that lasting love, that guaranteed love. How do you get to that point? As we said, you have to sacrifice, right? It's not something cheap that you can just buy without a price. It's not something you're just going to get as a freebie, uh, as if like, you know, you know, and you want to get cars out of the lot, so take it now and pay me over five years. <laughs> but when it's the brand new car, there's like, there's no zero percent on that one, right? This is something priceless, it's something very valuable. And so the Prophet Muhammad, for example, peace be upon him, just concurring the, the meanings here, how they all converge in our, in our tradition. He said to us that God has said that, <coughs> Whomever opposes those close to me, my dearest friends, my, my most cherished servants, I have declared war on those people. I mean, they are bound to meet, you know, my vengeance. He, then he explained how people become God's closest servants. He goes, and I'll, so God says, whoever combats, shows hostility, enmity to my, clo my cherished servants, uh, I have waged war on them. And then God says, and my servants do not come close to me with anything dearer to me than what I've made obligatory on them. Right? Fulfilling the obligation, fulfilling your duties. 
sacrificing, putting in the work to earn the love of God. Uh, and so, another example of this, another example of this, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said about Abraham in an authentic tradition, authentic hadith. Uh, he said, Abraham, peace be upon him, after he became 80 years old, he circumcised himself with the blade of an axe. Right? No, your, your head shouldn't go far like swinging an axe. But meaning all he could find was the blade of an axe, and he used that blade to circumcise himself. Over 80 years old. What's the message here? That, like, I was put in exile, right? I was thrown into a bonfire. I left my son and my family in a desert. Uh, no, he didn't list these things, because he knew that no matter what he gave, and no matter what he faced, God will not just be just to me, God will be gracious to me. And in fact, I don't deserve anything, right? I am indebted to be called his servant. I am indebted to live in his service. So he was not selective in his surrender, selective in his fulfillment of God's obligations. Even at 80 years old, when God tells him, this will be the hallmark of the people that carry your lineage or carry your tradition or carry your guidance, the, the, the people of purity, whatever way you want to interpret those verses in the Bible and in the Quran, but he wanted Abraham to be circumcised. Even that, he, he heard, he listened, and he obeyed, right? Like a true lover. <coughs> and then we move on, because I only have like 10 minutes left. I'll share with you perhaps one, one more thing regarding the story of, uh, of Abraham, peace be upon him. Uh, we believe that Abraham, peace be upon him, is the one that erected the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the sacred house in Mecca. We Muslims believe this is the first house of worship built for God on earth. One of the five pillars of Islam is what? Pilgrimage to the sacred house. This is the house that is in Mecca, present-day Saudi Arabia. I hate to say that because of all the politics happening today, right? But in Mecca, this house is built where God wants all the believers. We don't worship idols. We don't worship, right? That's the whole story of Abraham, the, one that, the part that I skipped that you all know. Right? He was cast out for rejecting paganism, rejecting idolatry, worshipping the untrue God who, who remains unseen so long as we're in this life. And the greatest joy of the next life is getting to see God and seeing his face and living eternally with him in, par in palaces that never perish. That's our true life, the life of the hereafter. Uh, but he built this Kaaba, right? He built this Kaaba. He built this, this house of worship. And the Quran tells us, the Quran tells us, وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ And mention to them, O Muhammad, when Abraham was erecting the pillars, the columns of this house, putting it together, him and his son Ishmael, it's after he grew a little bit older now, رَبَّنَا uh, تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا And they were saying as they were erecting it, O oh, our Lord, accept this, meaning this, this meek effort, this humble effort, this imperfect effort, this human effort from us. Right? Accept this from us. Inna ka anta samir al alim. Certainly, you are the one who hears all. You hear our prayers. You are al alim. You you know best. You know this is the best we have, uh, and that we cannot offer anything better. One of the early earliest scholars of Islam, his name was Wahab al Warb. Whenever he used to recite this verse, he would weep, and he would say, "This is the friend of God, building the greatest house of God." Uh, by a command from God, like it's not even like you're guessing, will this please God or not? You're not taking a shot in the dark here. God told you to do it. Like you know that this pleases him. So he said, this is the friend of God, building the house of God by a command from God, and he's concerned that it will not be accepted of him. He's afraid he's doing it with pride. He's doing it with conceit, doing it like someone owes God a favor, and none of us do. We cannot repay God for his favors, so how can we ever earn reward? It's all by his grace at the end that he invites us in, and that he rewards us beyond what we deserve. That's what we mean, that's the concept of grace as we understand it as Muslims. And so he remained concerned, he remained afraid. And being hopeful of God, we believe in Islam, this will be my last point, being hopeful of God, by definition, must involve the fear of God. Because you're not certain, you're hopeful, right? You're not certain, you're not certain that you're not full of yourself. Because what was the problem of the devil? 
what was the problem of Iblis in all the faith traditions? He became arrogant, right? So he ascended so high, but then he fell again. So we have no guarantee that we will not fall. So our purpose in life is not an event. It's a process. It's ending on the right foot. It doesn't matter what happens along the way. What matters is finishing right. And so you must remain hopeful, never lose hope in God, but you should never have this false sense of security where you're certain God has to treat me well. God, no, God is not going to equate between Jesus, peace be upon him, and the people that tried to kill him, perhaps, you know, those that didn't repent. He's not going to equate between Moses, peace be upon him, and Hitler <laughs> or something, right? At the end of the day, God's mercy is unlimited, but he's not limited by his mercy. His mercy doesn't stop him from being just in the Islamic narrative again. He has to be just at the end of the day. If, if, if I, if even as human beings, imperfect human beings, if we uh, treated like the golden citizen, like the vigilante, we would just be so reprehensible for this, right? We would, this is a condemnable behavior. This is unjust, unfair, foolish, everything. So that expectation of God, uh, we are told Islamically is inappropriate. It's very problematic. So just bringing it back full circle, Abraham was so hopeful of God, right? And so grateful to have a relationship with God, but hopefulness did not equal false sense of security. There's always fear, because that's the definition of hope. Hope means I'm not sure, I hope, right? And so the fear of God was always there as well, that he does not own his own guidance, and he does not guarantee his own guidance, and he cannot guarantee that he will always remain at that station of being the friend of God. He has to continue being eligible for it, right? You can never take it for granted. And so of the most beautiful prayers of, of Abraham that God immortalized in the Quran is that he used to say, Oh my Lord, protect me and my progeny from worshiping the idols. Like this is a person who fought his life against the idols, fought his life against the false gods, was outcast by his father and exiled by his people and because of his re rejection of the idol. But he's saying, that's not from me. That's you guiding me. And if you pull your guidance from me, if you turn the lights off on my heart, I can do this. I'm lost without you. And so Ibrahim al one of the early Muslims as well, he used to also, he would weep when he would hear this verse, uh, protect me and my children from uh, worshipping the idols. And he would say, and who of us could ever feel secure after Abraham was concerned? And that's why we as Muslims, every single time when we pray, we constantly are taught that we must repeat the opening chapter in the Quran. Praise be to Allah, Lord of the worlds, the most merciful, the most compassionate, owner of the day of judgment. Guy, uh, you only do worship and only with you do we seek strength. This is the part of reference that I'm asking for. Guide us the straight path. Guide us the straight path. Because we need it at every moment. And we need it renewed and extended. We need an extension on it until we meet him. Uh, I hope I wasn't too uh, jumpy with all the different scenes. But I was trying to collect for you as much and then weave it all together in the end. Uh, if anything I said was correct or of benefit that's from God and God alone, anything wrong or confusing I said, that's all my fault, and I apologize for that. No. Uh, Sheikh, uh, before we give it a short break, could you please, uh, in the beginning you mentioned that uh, Quran explains the whole purpose of uh, life for yes. hu uh, for a mu Muslim, for, uh, for a human. Uh, could you please explain what does Quran mean for a Muslim and like what's it, how it was revealed what, uh, shortly? Could you yes, I kind of, I guess... Uh, assumed that was uh, mentioned in earlier classes. Wrong assumption. So the Quran, the Quran, we believe, is the literal word of God. Uh, sometimes I just rush and say the final testament, but kind of as we believe that God did reveal testaments to the previous prophets, scriptures. Uh, we do believe God sent to Moses the Torah. We do believe God sent the Jesus the evangel. We do believe that God revealed to David the Psalms. Uh, we do believe that Abraham received some scripture, uh, received a scripture. Uh, we believe that the final prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, received uh, the final word of God, the Quran. Uh, the Quran means the recital. 
and there's so much to be said about the Quran, but the Quran was revealed in the context of the Prophet's life, that it would be best understood. So it was revealed over the course of 23 years. And it was revealed because, uh, and I hope you'll forgive my frankness and appreciate my honesty. We, we believe in Islam that God, time and time again, revealed scriptures to nations and entrusted them with protection, safeguarding those scriptures and living up to them. And so time and time again, that trust for one reason or another, someone wanted to be king, or someone wanted, that, that trust was, uh, that covenant was broken and the books were compromised, the books were altered, they were adulterated. And so God being the most merciful would not leave people uh, in limbo like this. And so he continued to send another book after another book after another book to humanity with the prophets. That's the story of scripture. Except that the Quran, it was, determined by God that this would be the final scripture. And so we're not saying the Muslims did any better of a job at this. <laughs> we're saying that God said that we are no longer entrusting you with protecting it, per se. We promise to protect this book and it will never be lost. Your obligation now is to consider it sacred and live up to it. Make it your, your, uh, your testament, your life manual. And so that's why the Quran exists. Until today, God's promise is never broken. Uh, it's not that God couldn't protect the previous scriptures. We don't believe that God can't. That, that sentence would be, always be wrong, right? Uh, we do believe that God chose not to. He chose to test people with protecting it. As for this last one, God said, I am assuming the protection of this book. And that's why the Quran only exists uh, in one version, in the original language. The book remains intact. There are no variations. There is no discrepancy. Even if you were to take every last copy of the Quran today and, and shred it and burn it and, and throw the ashes in the oceans, there are tens of millions of people from China, little five-year-old kids in China and Brazil and Germany and America and Mexico and everywhere else that memorize the Quran letter for letter by heart, all 114 chapters, 6,200 plus verses. The Quran remains intact in its original language without uh, any sort of uh, discrepancy in that. And that's basically what we believe about the Quran. Uh, thank you very much. Let's give a short break, and there are some refreshments. And after that, let's sit back again. Okay. <laughs>